verse 32. And if you have a hard time finding 1 Chronicles, it's right before 2 Chronicles. It's the best joke I have tonight, what can I say? So, 1 Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 32. Of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200, and all their kingsmen were at their command. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. I'll read it one more time. Of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200, and all their kinsmen were at their command. Let's say a prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word, Father God, because in your word are hidden all the knowledge that we need, Father God, here on this earth. And we pray, Father God, that you'll open our eyes to understand about Issachar and the Issachar anointing, Father God, tonight. Open our hearts, open our spiritual eyes now, in Jesus' name, and everybody said a good, amen. So Issachar was one of the sons of Israel, one of the 12 sons of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 30, verse 14 to 18, we read the story of how Issachar came to be. And it's sort of an interesting story. So Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 to 18 during the wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Now, let's set the stage just a little bit for those of you who don't remember exactly how this goes. So Israel, that is, remember Jacob, who later becomes Israel, marries Rachel and Leah. And remember, Leah... Not his favorite. He married Leah because he had to marry her. Um, but he really wanted Rachel. And so they have this sort of competition of who can have more sons. And of course, some of the sons come from their maidservants. So it's kind of an interesting soap opera uh, that's going on in, in his house. And so anyway, one of uh, the older sons, Reuben, goes out in the field, finds some mandrake plants, brings them to his mother, Leah. Rachel says to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Now, there's no love lost between Rachel and Leah. They don't like each other, to say the least. And um, so, but she said... Wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take away my son's mandrakes too? So what she's implying is, look, I know that my husband loves you and not me. So lighten up. I don't owe you anything. And very well, Rachel says, and Rachel says, he can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. Now this does kind of sound like a soap opera, doesn't it? Um... Yeah, they have to be really good mandrakes. That's a good point. Um, so then, when Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him and says, You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. Wow, there, there's quite a marriage, huh? That's an interesting relationship. So he slept with her that night. And God listened to Leah... And she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. And then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my maidservant to my husband. So she named him Issachar. So that how is how the fifth of the 12. So there's 12 tribes. There's Issachar is the head of one of the tribes. And we're going to learn about Issachar tonight because there are some Amazing things to know about Issachar. First of all, the meaning of his name is he will bring a reward. You know, when you think about naming your children, I named my son after my dad because I love my dad very much. So I named my son after my dad to honor my dad. Um, 
But you need to think about, and, and there's things about my son that I see my dad in him. And so you need to really think about how you name people. In fact, we were talking real, re oh, we were talking Saturday morning at the men's breakfast about, about our, our name, you know, our spiritual names and what they mean for, for us. So anyway, Issachar means he will bring a reward. That's a pretty cool name. I mean, if I got to bring, get, name something, he will bring a reward is a pretty cool name. So I like that. So, in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 5, it talks about their relatives among all the families of Issachar were mighty men of valor, enrolled by genealogy in all 87,000. So, here's the thing about Issachar's family. We learn, in fact... Uh, I'm going to go actually read this because I want to read something. This is 1 Chronicles chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. 1 Chronicles 7, 1 through 5. It is interesting that normally during the week I read only out of electronic Bibles. And coming back to paper Bibles is interesting. Now the sons of Issachar were four, Tola, Puha, Jashub, and Shimron. And the sons of Tola were Uzi, Raphiah, Jeriel, Jamiel, Ibsen, and Samuel, heads of their father's households. The sons of Tola were mighty men of valor in their generation. So listen, these were mighty men of valor. So not only was he named about reward, he will bring reward, he has 200 key offspring who are known as mighty men of valor. Wow, that's pretty exciting in the realm that they live in to have to be known as a mighty man of valor because that means, you know, you can fight. Fighting was very important back in those days. It's, it's still important now, but we kind of let it be taken over by the armies. We don't jump out there ourselves unless you're a veteran, in which case you do. But um, they were, so they have military power. They were a powerful military tribe. And then not only were they a powerful military tribe, but they were a powerful financial tribe, okay? Israel's Issachar's allotment in the promised land primarily consisted of the Valley of Jezreel. Now, the Valley of Jezreel would be like the San Joaquin Valley in, in California. And I don't know how many of you know this, but the San Joaquin Valley in California is the breadbasket of the world. I mean, they ship out an incredible amount of agricultural products, food products to the world um, that are very valuable. And over there, that's where Wendy's dad lives and he lives out on a vineyard and, you know, they grow very expensive grapes out there. And then this week I was down uh, visiting uh, some friends and seeing a man I know named James, Joe Cicchino who was down there and with my, and I was spent the night, a couple nights at my spiritual father's house and when I was talking with him, you know, he talks about the real money people down in that Fresno region are who? The farmers. You know, normally, when you go to different parts of the world, the people who farm and ranch are poor people. You know, they're not poor, poor, but lots of ranches. I know, I know of ranchers who have huge amounts of land, but really just barely get by. But not so in the San Joaquin Valley. Those people are wealthy. The farmers are the ones with the money. In fact, you think about the prophetic words over Israel. When, when you're trapped, those of you who have gone to Israel, you know that in Israel, they have incredible wealth that's in their agriculture. And so Issachar was really an incredibly rich farmland, and it also had access down to the Mediterranean Sea. So not only did they have incredible wealth, but they had access to shipping ports to get it out and sell it all over the world. Not only that, but in, in um, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, we read this. 
of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going forth, and Issachar, in your tents. They will call peoples to the mountain, and they will offer righteous sacrifice, and they will draw out of the abundance of the seas and the hidden treasures of the sand. Wow. How would you like to have those prophetic words over your family? You know, the reason that I'm doing this message tonight is because I was up at Bethel a few years ago and someone prophesied over me and said, you have an Issachar anointing. And I just kind of went, thank you. I have no idea what you just said. Which is not really true. I had a little bit of an idea. But I've wanted to take some time to really unpack this Issachar anointing and I believe that if somebody can pray over me and pray an Issachar anointing on me, then I might be able to pray an Issachar anointing on you. Does it sound pretty good? Yeah, I would say it's good. So I'm receiving it. How do we get things in the kingdom of God? By faith, right? That's right. And also by laying out of hands. So... I'm going to, I by faith, I receive that prophetic word of the Issachar anointing. I go, okay, I take it. I only knew a little bit about it. And I said, someday I'm going to preach a message on the Issachar anointing. So you guys came on the right night to receive the Issachar anointing. So, um, so let me read the last couple verses there in verse 19. Um, for they will draw out the abundance of the seas and the hidden treasures of the sand. So it sounds like not only were they getting uh, uh, stuff out of the, the land and great agricultural wealth, but they were getting stuff out of the ocean, which is full of riches, and getting things out of uh, the sand, which might have been mining, might have been minerals, right? Which is where we get a lot of our wealth in Nevada. Uh, the gold producing. And it's interesting that we're the silver state, but I think we're currently the number one gold producer in the United States as well. So we get here in Nevada a lot of wealth out of the ground. In fact, there's a guy who uh, comes to this church, used to come all the time, comes kind of irregularly now, but he and I actually went out and uh, established some mining claims for some silver and gold mines. So there's great wealth in this state. Okay? Is Issachar's spiritual prosperity was also evident uh, among... Uh, hold on, let me take... I might have fallen. My pages might have gotten out of order here. Oh, isn't this nice? Oh, look at this. Hmm. That's very interesting. You know, you know the, when the devil's after you... Interesting things happen. So my printer ran out of ink. I have a new iMac computer that we bought last year. And it doesn't tell you it runs out of ink. So then I had to print it up on my wife's printer. And so now who knows what was going on here. So we're just going to have to move through this. So let's see. Where are we on? We're on financial servanthood. Okay. Okay. And, all right, well, we're just going to see how this works out. Okay, so that's the financial. Let's go on to the spiritual. Issachar's spiritual prosperity was also evident among Israel. They were one of six tribes to stand on Mount Gerizim as part of the sacred blessing ceremony. And I think that's in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 12. When you cross the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. So only half of the tribes were picked out for this particular blessing. Now, according to the Targum, now the Targum, if you haven't heard about that, the Targum is sort of like, uh, it's almost, uh, I I hesitate to say it's like anything, but it's what the rabbis would read the scriptures and then they would expand on the scriptures and it became a written thing, which 
is very important in, in Israel. It's also important to us in that it helps us to understand the context of what was going on. And so what the Targum says about Issachar is they excelled in the words of the law and were endued with wisdom and were obedient to their command. Their knowledge of God's word caused them to become the primary cultivator of Israel's spiritual treasures and their counsel and interpretations of scripture were received as authoritative. So they're starting to sound like the real deal, right? The whole package. Okay? They're mighty warriors. They have incredible financial wealth that they control. And now, when it comes to understanding the scriptures, they have amazing wisdom. And people look to them as their interpretation of a scripture is authoritative. How many now want a Issachar anointing? Amen. We're up to four people. Good. Okay. Great. Now, what they're known for most, and if you, if you, if you hear people talking about the Issachar anointing, this is what you're normally going to hear, is what I'm going to get into now. But I wanted to give you everything because I think that, uh, you know, I went on YouTube and went around and did some hunting around on this. And most of what you hear is about what I'm going to talk about now. They don't talk about how, how their, their wealth and the battles and, um, and their, their spiritual representative and how they have so much wisdom. Here's what normally you hear about the sons of Issachar, and that is the understanding of the times. The sons of Issachar were also biblical astronomers who kept track of the times and the seasons. Now, we've talked about this a lot because we like to celebrate some of the Jewish feasts here because celebrating the Jewish feasts helps us understand Israel and it helps us understand God. And uh, those of you who remember from your end times sermons that I've preached over the years uh, that, that Jesus may come at the only festival that is determined by the new moon. And so when, when Jesus said, you'll not know the day, many scholars believe that he was referring to understanding what day the new moon's going to come because they never really knew when would the new moon come. You know, they'd have the guy up on the, on the hill you know, looking, where does the new, when's that new moon coming? Nobody really knew. Now, now, with our great calculations and NASA can tell you when they're all going to happen. But back then, they really didn't know exactly. But everything on the Jewish calendar was tied in with the moons and the seasons, right? And so, these were actually the biblical astronomers. These were the guys who actually knew. It's like we have a friend who works at NASA. And of course, he is like top secret everything clearance. And it's fun to ask him questions because it's always pretty much the same answer. <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> he can't tell us anything. We just, for a while, I kind of was having fun just asking a bunch of questions. But I got tired of it pretty quick because I realized he wasn't going to say anything. Okay? So... Think about this. There's a lot of knowledge and knowledge is value. And think about the, the knowledge base that NASA has that they're not sharing with us. Things that they know that it would be important for us to know. So now on top of everything, Issachar's descendants are like the NASA of their time. They're the ones who are interpreting scripture, controlling wealth, uh, fighting battles, and now determining, literally determining what days, feast days start, which was an incredibly important part of the Jewish culture. This was huge. Like people are just like, oh yeah, whatever. They're astronomers. Well, great. But Richard's an astronomer. He's an amateur astronomer. See, he'd be like the, the Issachar of River Rock there. 
And the sons of Issachar, who had understanding to know the times and were skilled in fixing the beginnings of the year, because it determined when the new year start, the commencement of months and the intercalation of months and years, skillful in the changes of the moon and in fixing the lunar solemnities to their proper times, skillful also in the doctrine of the solar periods, astrologers and signs and stars that they might show Israel what to do. I mean, these were powerful people. You know, most, if you go in and ask most of your Bible friends, oh, tell me about the sons of Issachar, they're just like, I don't know, you know, uh, he was one of the sons of Israel. I think, I think most people are doing pretty good if they can remember he's one of the sons of Israel, right? I mean, this is powerful, heavy stuff. And you know, another thing, oh, I'm just giving you a little tease about something in the future that I want to get into. But I was listening to a biblical, let's see, what would I call him? Like a biblical astronomer mathematician who was talking about why, oh boy, if I get into this, it's so interesting, but it's because I listened to him for two and a half hours. But think about this, think about this. A nautical mile, so we have a British, kind of a British mile, right, that we go by, but, but when you get on an airplane, they talk about nautical miles, right? They're saying, we're, they don't say, well, we're going this many miles an hour, we're, we're going this many knots, right? Or, or our trip's going to be so many nautical miles. Well, where did the nautical mile come from? Well, the nautical mile came from the idea that the earth is divided up into 360 degrees. And each degree was 60 nautical miles, okay? And also, that's how we got the idea that how many days would be in a year? Well, there's 365 days in a year, Pastor. Maybe you're getting confused on this. Well, according to this guy, this was the one thing he said, and in two and a half hours, I was completely fascinated by everything this guy had to say uh, on this podcast. In fact, I'm going to go listen to it again. Just talking about it makes me want to go back now and listen to it again, is what his proposition was, and he says there's a lot of NASA data to back it up, is remember how in the Bible there was a couple stories where the sun stood still? Remember those stories? Well, that's with Hezekiah, okay, and Joshua, right? Before that time, this guy is saying, and I got to go back, in all fairness, I'm not ready to preach this, so don't walk out of here going... Ooh, you know, double check it with me or I'll tell you where to get the, the podcast. You can listen to it yourself. But he said prior to that, there was a perfect 360 days in the year. And the calendars were 360 days. And then when God intervened because God's men prayed to change the amount of days... Now we have to have 365 days in a year. And it, it messed up with that perfect 360. I can tell you another story too that I've preached in a message before. Again, it's years ago. But there's a story about the, the uh, first astronauts to go to the moon. They tried to use math to figure out the launch coordinators coordinates to send the first Apollo mission to the moon and the numbers never did work right. And then there was a Christian in NASA. I guess there's a lot of Christians in NASA. And there was a Christian in NASA who remembered the story about Hezekiah and thought about it, went back, read the Bible, thought to himself, made some rough calculations about how that one day that was too long and the one day when the, when the sun went backwards up the steps, recalculated the calculations to get the Apollo mission to the moon and it, they broke the code and got the correct coordinates because of Scripture. 
That's pretty heavy, right? So that shows you the power and authority that the sons of Issachar had. They were the ones who made known the appointed times and seasons when Israel should observe the feasts. Leviticus 23. Okay, since the Lord's feasts reveal God's plan and timing of his redemption and the Messiah, it's clear that the sons of Israel had an anointing which gave them a unique insight into God's timing of things past, present, and future. Now, some of you may have heard my message on the prophetic and timing, and I talk about how people in the prophetic movement get so frustrated because they get a prophetic word and it doesn't come true. Have you ever had a prophetic word and it hasn't come true yet? Okay? That's why prophetic words are anachronistic. Some of you may have heard my message on anachronistic, out of time. Okay? So it would be very important as a, a prophetic household or a prophetic person to have an Issachar anointing to know the times of the seasons. Okay? And the, the one example that you hear in the case of Issachar a lot is this, is that, remember, this was during the time that Saul was king, but the prophetic word said that there would be a new king and it would be David. And when all the 12 tribes went to line up, there was a lot of disagreement within all the tribes of Israel. Should we stick with Saul? Should we go forward with David? And the tribe of Issachar was the only tribe that was 100% behind David because they understood the times and the seasons and they knew David was the king who was supposed to be there. They were able to commit themselves 100% because of the prophetic word given in 1 Samuel 15.28. Okay, so the Lord granted them an anointing to understand the prophetic timing when he would tear the kingdom of Israel away from the rebellious Saul and give it to his sermon, his servant David. Now, do you think it would be important today to be able to understand the times and the seasons? Yeah, right? I mean, if you've been in the prophetic movement of any amount of times and if you watch all the stuff going on on the Elijah list and just all the stuff that's happening out there, I mean, you just got prophetic people giving prophetic words. You know, and, and I don't want to give up on the prophetic. Many churches have given up on the prophetic because it just got too confusing and too disconcerting. So the number one thing I want to leave with you, if you don't leave with anything else tonight, is prophetic, prophets are anachronistic. They're out of time. And, and if, just to give you a good example, is I'm very proud of my wife on this. My wife is very prophetic. And, and you'll see the prophetic in her in this. She expects, she sees everything in sort of a prophetic completeness. So she sees everything the way it should be. And I'm kind of the balance to that because, you know, you marry someone, you get to balance them out. I'm always the person that's like, well, we're, we're working on it. We're getting better all the time. But for her, that's, a, that's, not, a, that's not an answer. An answer is... It should be the way God wants it to be right now. It should be perfect. And if it's not perfect, she doesn't have a lot of tolerance for that. But it's not because she's a mean person. It's just because she sees into the future. And that's what really, like I say, that's what happens to a lot of us. We get a prophetic word. The prophet's looking out into the future. He sees the future. We go, that's fantastic. You know, we run home and look in the mailbox for the check. Well, that prophet might have been looking 20 years out, 50 years out. Might have been looking into glory. You don't know. That's why the Issachar anointing would be so nice. Because the Issachar anointing would allow us to be able to go, oh, boom. That, you know when that's going to happen? That's going to happen at 722 on October 17th. Now, we know a lot of people uh, having a lot of, you know, I was just reading a little article on the Jehovah's Witness, how many times the Jehovah's Witness have predicted the end of the world and it hasn't happened, right? 
Okay? And who was the guy who was just predicting the end of the world every few years? And uh, I, can't, I just saw his name. But anyways, right? Campy. Harold Campy. There you go. And so, you know, there's a lot of people out there. You know, their hearts may be in the right place. They may understand some prophetic things. But they don't have the when. So the when is like super important to people. And frankly... Most of the time, all we can say about the when is, right? I mean, there's people out there, you know, whenever I see a person, I've spent a hundred years studying every, uh, really, you and 500 other people who've been wrong. I always like to, you know, one of my favorite books in my library is 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. You know, come on. Okay. But here's another important thing about Issachar, okay, and the, the sons of Issachar. In a sense, they were forerunners of a renewed kingdom. Now, for many years, one of the number one words people would use to describe River Rock was forerunners. And I will tell you that oftentimes I have felt like a forerunner, but not always in a good way. You know, what are, what are some of the American cars that were designed so far ahead of people that they fell flat, right? The, the Edsel, remember the Edsel? I just watched the movie on, what did I just watch the movie on? A car they were making, they only made 50 of them. Um, hmm, I don't know. Anyways, it'll come to me. Then uh, what's, what was the AMC Pacer? Anybody remember the AMC Pacer? You know, it came out, it looked like a little spaceship, you know. Yeah, fishbowl on wheels. And now, of course, it's like totally retro and people love it. But, you know, the point being is that timing is... Let's try that again. Timing is... That's right. Timing is everything. But not only were the, the sons of Issachar forerunners of a renewed kingdom, but it, the renewed kingdom was built on obedience to God instead of rebellion and sin. Because Saul, you know, you take a look at that. Saul was all about rebellion and sin. And the sons of Issachar were all about serving God in integrity and being faithful and not being rebellious and not being sinful. And we're going through a number of shifts in the kingdom right now. And having an Issachar anointing is an important thing right now. But I was actually having a discussion with somebody today about how the rebelliousness and the sin that can affect the body of Christ and have people doing things out of their own personal needs and desires instead of following God. So one of the most difficult challenges in life is to really hear God and then do what God says instead of doing what you want to do and then using the God card. Say, well, God told me. You know, as a pastor, that's one of the most frustrating things. I have people come and tell me the wildest, craziest things that God told them to do. And then I watch their lives take a nose daub, you know, a nose dive, a nose job too, maybe. <sighs> and you're just like, really? That's what God told you to do? <laughs> okay. So when we want to be forerunners of a renewed kingdom, that's great. But a big part of that is not being in rebelliousness, not being sin, being able to hear God, not being in rebellion to God. Um, this brought honor and prosperity according to the earlier prophecies given by Jacob and Moses. So as we approach the end of the age in difficult times, it becomes clear that we need to be more and more like the sons of Issachar. And my final scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 
So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. So scripture is very clear that a prophetic word is very important and having a prophetic culture in your church is very important. The problem is prophetic people tend to be prophetic people. And so when you're a prophetic person, you have to really live in obedience to God. You really have to live a life outside of self-will, outside of sin. And you have to understand. So Peter is saying, look, we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. So here we are, living in dark times, and in those dark times, we need a prophetic word that we can trust. Very good. That was your time to put amen in. So, here's what I would like to do. Is, um, I would like to have our sound man put on some sound, uh, some music. And here's what I'm going to do. So I received, I had someone pray over me up at Bethel and lay hands on me and say I had the Issachar anointing. And I'm, I can't really tell you exactly what that means. But I can tell you, especially after doing this more in-depth study, I hope you're kind of excited about who Issachar was. And I am, would love to lay hands on anyone who wants to come forward. And I'll pray for you about anything in particular. But I will pray the Issachar anointing over you. There you go. We have two people. And then 